Eugene Watts may be the most prolific serial killer in U.S. history. He's already admitted to killing more than a dozen women, but authorities believe the actual number may be closer to 100, which is why what we're going to tell you is so shocking. Coral Watts is scheduled to be released from prison in less than two years after serving just 24 years of a 60-year sentence. How can that be? It turns out Texas authorities made a deal with the devil back in 1982. They agreed to a plea bargain they thought would keep Watts behind bars for the rest of his life. But the deal has come back to haunt them. And Coral Watts may become the first serial killer ever to be set free. For the past 22 years, Coral Watts has been locked up in the Texas prison system, all but forgotten. What's amazing to me is everybody in America has heard of a Ted Bundy, a John Wayne Gacy, Jeffrey Dahmer. But when you mention the name of Coral Eugene Watts, 99.99% of the public has no clue who you're talking about. Andy Kahn is hoping to change that. As director of the Crime Victims Office for the mayor of Houston, he's trying to find some way, any way, to keep Coral Watts from being released. I guarantee you, if he is released, women are going to turn up murdered. There's no ifs, ands, or buts. This is a man that is owned by his own admission, stated, uh, I'm going to kill again if they ever release me. You do not rehabilitate a serial killer. Watts has been in trouble since he was 15 years old when he attacked a woman on his paper route. He's been in and out of C3, but police had no evidence linking Watts to the murder. He was also a suspect in a series of slayings in the Detroit area. But once again, there was not enough evidence to arrest him. Watts's ability to elude authorities followed him to Ann Arbor, Michigan. It was 1980 when three young women were brutally murdered by someone the police and newspapers dubbed the Sunday Morning Slasher. Paul Bunton... Now the police chief in Saline, Michigan, was the lead investigator in that case and says Coral Watts quickly became the prime suspect. We knew that I, I suspected him of three homicides. Even the point where I demonstrated, I said, Coral, I know exactly how you did it. And I stood up and I put my arm around his, his neck and I said, you did it just like this. By then, Bunton had put Watts under 24-hour police surveillance. When Watts decided to skip town, Bunton tracked him to Houston and sent police there an urgent warning. We put this very large packet of information, including fingerprints, photographs, photographs of his car, highlights of our reports. And I called Houston Homicide and talked with a detective down there and told him, I mean, uh, this guy is a predator. You need to watch him. When Coral Watts showed up in Houston in 1981, it was the perfect hunting ground for a serial killer. Houston was the murder capital of the United States that year with more than 700 homicides. The police were underpaid, understaffed, and overwhelmed. So when Coral Watts began killing young women, no one suspected that it might be the work of one man. Watts would later confess to stalking and killing 12 Texas women. The first victim, Linda Tilly, was drowned. Elizabeth Montgomery was stabbed. Two hours later, so was Susan Wolfe. Ellen Tam was hanged. Margaret Fossey was asphyxiated. Elena Samander was strangled and left in a trash dumpster. He is a cold-blooded, diabolical killing machine. Emily LaQuay was just 14. Anna Lede, a medical student. Yolanda Gracia, Carrie Jefferson, and Suzanne Searles were all killed as they returned home. Watts killed at random. There were no patterns, no motives, no eyewitnesses, and no evidence. Trust me, if we had the goods on Coral Eugene Watts, we wouldn't be talking today. That's how good this guy was. But Watts's luck ran out on May 23rd, 1982. He spotted a woman leaving a Houston nightclub and followed her home. Michelle Madej was killed on her 20th birthday. Her body dumped into a bathtub. Watts moved on to another apartment complex where he would confront his last two victims. Melinda Aguilar had just turned 19. He came in and grabbed me and started choking me. And he told me if I screamed, he would kill me. Watts tied up Melinda and her roommate and began filling the bathtub with water. He was excited and hyper and clapping and just making noises like he was excited that this is going to be fun. Clapping? Yeah, yeah kind of like did this to his hands. And, and that's when I knew that uh, I had to do something. There was no doubt in your mind he was going to kill you? No doubt. As Watts tried to drown her roommate in the bathtub, 
Melinda managed to escape, throwing herself off the second floor balcony. Neighbors called police, the roommate was saved, and Watts, a 28-year-old bus mechanic, was arrested as he tried to flee. But on the day Watts was set to go to trial, a deal was struck with the Houston District Attorney. In exchange for a guilty plea to burglary with the intent to commit if he was given immunity for them. In the eyes of the district attorney, it was a good deal. It got a mass murder off the streets for a long time and resolved a dozen open cases. Detective Tom Ladd was brought in to take Watts' confession. Did you have any evidence linking him to the crimes that he confessed to? No. Is he that good? How about Lucky? That's your couple of people. It took Watts more than a week to describe how he had stalked and killed each of his victims, and he led investigators to three shallow graves. What's he like? Very congenial. He didn't act like a killer until you start listening to what he's telling you or following the directions to his crime scenes. Do you have a good memory? Excellent memory. Very, very intelligent. He never got the facts of one murder mixed up with the facts of another murder. He, he never missed. He'd tell you why he did it? We'd ask him, we'd say, well, why did you kill this girl or that girl? He'd go, they have evil in their eyes. Could he see their eyes? No. Well, almost all his victims were picked out at night. I'm sure. And we said, Cole, you couldn't see her eyes. He said, yeah, that she's got evil in her eyes. What was his M.O.? I mean, how did he operate? He'd get in that car of his and he'd drive around, you know, and, you know, sometimes he'd drive all night long and then he'd see a female, whatever it was about that female, which we still to this day don't know why he picked one girl and passed up 20 others. Once he picked his victim, Watts killed quickly. None of his victims were sexually assaulted. Most were killed just steps from their front doors. One girl, he just walked up and she turned and she, he stabbed her one time in the heart, turned around and ran away. Probably spent 15 seconds there, and then an hour and a half later, another one. At one point, Watts said he was willing to confess to 22 murders in Michigan, and a call went out to detectives like Paul Button in Ann Arbor. The next day... Hello, Moto. We sat down with our prosecuting attorney, and we all agreed that you don't give immunity to somebody who's committed murder. There's just no way you can do that. Even to clear up the cases? Just because we couldn't prove it doesn't mean we don't know who did it. Did he ever give you any indication why he'd committed these murders? I asked him that specific question. Why did you kill these girls? And he says, I'll take that to my grave with me. Do you have any ideas? No, none. He's driven to do this. What drives him? I have no idea. But Button did manage to have one last conversation with Coral Watts in a Texas penitentiary. And I said, Coral, I haven't got enough fingers and toes to count the number of people you've killed, have I? And he looked around the room and said, there's not enough fingers and toes in this room. How many people? Four of us. That would be 80. That would be 80. You think he's killed 80 people? Don't know. Don't know. I asked him, uh, I asked him if he confessed to everything down in Texas. And he said, no. And I says, why? Why didn't you? He made the statement to me that he does not want to go down in history as a mass murderer. And I said, you know what, that ship sailed. At the time, it seemed a moot point because everyone assumed Coral Watts would die in prison, an old man. But a series of court rulings changed that. As a first time offender, Watts was granted time off for good behavior. Three days off his sentence for every day served. So instead of serving a 60 year sentence under Texas law, Watts would automatically be released after just 24 years. He'll have served less than two years for every Houston homicide victim that he murdered. That's incredible. It's never happened before in this country's history. Because Watts had been given immunity back in 1982, there was nothing Texas could do to keep Watts in prison. But Michigan was another story. The cause of death on this one was manual strangulation. As soon as authorities in Michigan found out that Coral Watts might be released, they created a special task force headed by Lieutenant Bill Hanger to begin digging through every unsolved homicide that Coral Watts might possibly be linked to. You've investigated 200 cold cases. I mean, how many of those do you think that Coral Watts might have committed? Well, roughly 90 cases uh, we still consider him a suspect on. You've got a suspect, and now you're trying to find the crime. Correct. Usually it works the other way around. Well, he said that he would 
uh, confessed to 22 or so Michigan cases if he was granted immunity. So I know there's at least 22 out there. Assistant Attorney General Donna Pendergast says appeals were made to the public for information to get the first lead. It's really miraculous, but out of all the hundreds of cases that the task force was looking at, a witness from one of them said, hey, I know something, and he came forward. Um, I got a note on my desk, saw one of Coral Watts' murders. And my first reaction, of course, was, sure you did. He had seen Watts' picture on television and said, that's the guy that I saw commit this murder? Absolutely. The eyewitness, Joseph Foy, was the same person who called police in 1979 to report the stabbing death of 35-year-old Helen Dutcher in an alley of a Detroit suburb. According to the police reports, it was dark. Foy didn't describe seeing the actual murder and only saw the killer's face for a brief moment. They're looking for anything, any murder, any witness, any anything that they could pin on him. Ron Kaplovitz is the court-appointed attorney for Coral Watts. He says his client may be a confessed serial killer, but says there's not much evidence that he killed Helen Dutcher. It's hard to believe that a person who could see a person in an alley for a few minutes, a dark alley, 25 years ago, could come into a courtroom, point to that person and say, that's the guy I saw in the alley 25 years ago. There's no physical evidence? None whatsoever. But after two years of investigating, this is the best case the state of Michigan has been able to come up with. Prosecutors may be counting on Coral Watts to convict himself with his own words. The judge in the case has just ruled that the jury can be told about the murders Watts confessed to in Texas. And the jury will also be allowed to hear from his last victim, Melinda Aguilar. Are you worried about him getting out? Absolutely. He is admitted to killing again if he was to get out, and I believe he will. Do you worry about him coming after you? I do. I can still remember when I had to identify him. Just the, the way he looked at me was one of those looks like you just wait when I get out. All I remember is his evil eyes. Evil eyes. Mm-hmm. Coral Watts is scheduled to go to trial for the murder in Michigan in early November, but the special task force is still looking for other homicides to charge him with in the event that Watts is acquitted in this one.